Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jocelyn Ross with South Carolina Hands and Voices, and you see the topic Tuesday that we have for today. Um, and we're so excited to have Matt Gatlin with us from Beginnings SC, and he's their Deaf and Hard of Hearing Advocacy Specialist Program. So just take a minute to look at that. It's some really interesting stuff, including my son would love the fact that he volunteered as a firefighter. My son, AJ, is eight now, and he, he would absolutely love the firefighter background and um, love the education at Gallaudet. My daughter actually was able to attend summer camp there because we're originally from Washington, D.C. So a lot of nice connections with Matt and had the opportunity to meet him. And it's been a pleasure to have him at Beginnings SC and working with him through South Carolina Hands and Voices. And so we appreciate him giving us an overview on this presentation. And um, we have a couple of guests. If you don't mind, just put it in the chat, whether you're a parent or a professional, um, and even maybe where you're from, so we can just see about the reach that we're doing with these presentations. But right now, I'm going to turn it over to Matt to give us his presentation. Thank you. All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Jocelyn, for such a wonderful introduction. It's, it's interesting to hear about your son, AJ. So any of you have read my bio and my background, I'd like to explain a little bit more about who I am. I was born and when I was 18 months old, um, my parents noticed that I wasn't really responding to sounds and noises. You know, like when they'd say my name, I wouldn't answer, I wouldn't respond. And so they brought me to the audiolo audiologist and they recognized that I was deaf, identified me as deaf. Now, obviously 1988, 1989, that was you know, quite a few years ago. And they didn't really know a lot about deafness. You know, there was no technology. My parents were clueless as to what to do. You know, they worried so much. But luckily, the audiologists had a lot of experience uh, with deaf, the deaf community in Southern California. So they had so much there, the deaf school, you know, they had dealt with people with hearing aids and, you know, different therapies and stuff. So a lot of resources were available. And so my parents felt a lot better that they had all these resources and things at their disposal. So 10 years later, 1999, still a lot of parents, you know, all over the U.S. didn't know what to do. They didn't have those resources. <clears throat> That's why here at Beginning, South Carolina, we have a team and we discuss, you know, we've decided to set up a deaf advocacy program or deaf advocacy specialist. So that's who I am. It's a really new program. We've just started just a few months ago. And we've already had so many families who are interested in, in us. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about what the Deaf Advocacy Specialist does, and we call it the DAS for short. The DAS or the Deaf Advocacy Specialist, there's a lot of responsibilities. We provide advocacy for parents, um, and how we advocate, uh, you know, I share my personal experience growing up as a deaf and hard of hearing person. Um, before I continue, I, can, I identify as hard of hearing. I'll just let you know that. 
you know, each person has their own identity in the deaf community, you know, deaf, hard of hearing, whatever, but mine, I tend to identify as hard of hearing. So, but I'm signing now. We provide advocacy. We provide ASL tutors. Uh, we, you know, knowledge, deep knowledge about the deaf culture and how things go there. And for an example, my experience growing up, it might be similar to many deaf and hard of hearing people, but at the same time, it could be very different because my background is different from other people's background. We're not all the same. So I went to Gallaudet University. And when I got there, I was shocked because I saw all the different, you know, backgrounds, different experiences. You had a hard of hearing, you had deaf, um, you know, new signers, people who just starting to learn to sign, people with cochlear implants, people who spoke for themselves. Uh, it was such a variety. It's kind of overwhelming. And so I met a lot of friends there and, and I learned a lot from them and their experiences. And, you know, and we had some similarities and we had some differences and I incorporated all that into my personal experience and their personal experience, I incorporated all that together. And so when I meet with families for the first time, I tend to ask them, you know, I'll ask them a lot of questions like, um, what do you struggle with? What do you, what would you want? You know, I, I want to know more about them. You know, tell me more about yourself. You know, about your child. You know, I'm curious. I, I ask them all these questions. And then after I'm done with that, then I try to, to come up with what's best for that situation, what their needs are. And then we talk about how often, you know, I should meet with the family. You know, we prefer meeting in person, you know, so we can, you know, have some hands-on, some books and some written stuff. But because of COVID, of course, you know, for now we're meeting virtually. And at the age, of, depending on the age of the, of the child, if they're really young, then I focus on the parents. You know, I try to, to, to help them. But if the child is older, then, you know, we work on communication, ASL or through spoken English or whatever language. I tend to meet with the child themselves. You know, ask them the questions. But sometimes I've noticed that the parents have a lot of um, needs that they, you know, things that they need. And so I put those down and then I ask the child what they need and they don't match. They're different. So that's interesting. So try to incorporate both of their viewpoints, the parents' needs and the child's needs, and I try to integrate those. So I can build a better bridge and better communication access for the parents and for the child. Now that's a broad view of that, uh, of, the, of what I do. I also go to IMP meetings, IEP meetings. Yeah, I haven't had experience with that. I've just been in one, but I expect that one day I will go involved, you know, or, you know, just drop in or just see what's going on, you know, maybe provide a little bit of information. I do provide advice. For example, you know, what is advocacy? Like some things you might not even, might not even occur to you and they're very interesting. For example, some hard of hearing student or children use a hearing aid. That's me. I have a hearing aid. 
you know, they go in and, and, you know, they can hear things, they listen to things, the sound, but you know, the sound, how the sound travels and bounces off of things, you know, it echoes, can be confusing. You know, a lot of background noise. When I was at Gallaudet, I noticed that all the classes had carpet in the rooms on the floors. I didn't think any much about it at the time, but when I was at the Florida School for the Deaf, all the classrooms had carpet. So finally I asked, I said, what's going on? Why do they all have carpet in the rooms? When I went to a public school, there's no, they don't have carpets there. You know, they have tile on the floor. So why did the deaf school have carpet? Because carpet absorbs the sound. It prevents that echo. So that was interesting. That was a good point. So I tried it myself. Uh, in my old house in Florida, it has tile all over the house. You know, because the sand gets on the floors, you don't want to vacuum all the time. So it's easier to clean the tile. So, uh, so I went in the house and I started yelling and I noticed it was pretty loud. You know, it's kind of echoey. So I bought a rug and put rugs in every room. And when I yelled, it reduced the sound a little bit. And I was like, oh, I get it now. So that's one example of, you know, things that you might not consider, you know, a deaf person's viewpoint. You know, I was in the deaf community myself, but I didn't even realize it. So it's interesting. Another example would be like the other day, one of the mothers, so I was a little confused. My son always grabs my chin and makes me look at him when I'm talking. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a pretty common thing. Deaf and hard hearing depend on looking at your mouth while you're talking. Like when you're driving and you're looking straight ahead and they can't see your mouth, it's harder. That's why they want you to look at them, you know, so they can see what you're saying. And the mom said, but that's dangerous to do while I'm driving. <laughs> so, but I explained really uh, the viewpoint, you know, they need to see your lips and see your mouth. And so finally she understood, she didn't even have any thought of that. So another example would be like, um, let's talk about speech therapy. You know, if parents are deaf, what do they do? Oh, oh, sorry, the interpreter misunderstood. So if, if my parents found out, when they found out I was deaf, my parents, you know, they didn't know what to do with me. You know, lots of trips to the audiologist, um, lots of tests, you know. And over time, they realized that they had, that I had enough hearing in my left ear that I could use a hearing aid. And that made things a lot better. And so they said I should go to speech therapy. And my parents were like, okay. Oh, that was tough for my mom. She's a mama bear. <laughs> She's tough. So when I was three years old, I was really young. I was riding the bus with some older kids. We get on the bus and we're traveling. It was an hour each way to the deaf school. That's where I was learning ASL and just, you know, just regular kindergarten stuff. <laughs> so I got on the bus. And so we an hour there, an hour back. And when I got home, was I done? No. Then my parents take me to speech therapy. But the speech therapist came to my house and we sat down for an hour. I think it was three or four times a week I had speech therapy. One hour. You know, lot, lots of learning, lots of teaching. And we did that for three years. 
And then I moved to Texas. And when I got to Texas, at the elementary school there, there were no deaf students, no interpreters. Wow, that was my first time. It was very awkward. I had no access to communication. But by that time, I was hearing pretty well. I was talking pretty well. So I just decided I didn't need an interpreter. And then I started struggling, having struggles with the teacher because that time I had an auditory trainer in the box, you know, with the little wires and the, you know, the things in my ears so that amplified the sound. And still when the teacher would turn to write on the board, I'm looking at the back of her head and trying to figure out and I missed so much information. So by third grade, I was already falling way behind. But at the time I didn't really, I just thought I was not a good student. I didn't think about it being related to me being hard of hearing and missing all those informa that information, all those information gaps. And so I noticed, and so I was trying to, to talk with the teacher. And so the teacher said that I needed to be in a deaf program with an interpreter. And so I'd have more access to communication and how important that was. And so they found a school that was just a few miles from my house and that's where they put me. And oh, here we go again with the awkwardness. I had forgotten about how to sign. So I had to relearn to sign. So I worked on it. And then I realized I, re I like that better. You know, there's an interpreter there at my disposal. You know, it was, it was great. And was I a better student? Not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm just not a, an academic. But anyway, the communication access was, is so important whether that's ASL, spoken language, cued speech, whatever, it's important to have something that provides communication access so the student can succeed, you know, with the student and the family. So that's my role as a deaf advocacy specialist. So I've talked about my personal experience. Uh, I talked about deaf culture now. Oh, I'm trying to look at your comments. Okay, or the chat. Oh, something else. Another example about deaf etiquette. You know, things that are normal in the deaf community, um, like, so if two people are signing together, they're standing, you know, opposite each other and conversing, and I've noticed people try to get past and go through and they're, they don't want to be rude and they try to duck down, you know, duck walk through there and, or they just stand there and wait for the conversation to finish. Really in deaf culture, it's okay to just go on through, just walk on through. You're not going to interrupt us. You know, it's not going to bother us. If you stand there, then that's distracting. We're like, what's going on? Do you need something? So. So if you see two deaf people standing, talking to each other, that's, you know, you can just go right in through and it's not considered rude. So that's another example that I thought of. So that's all I have at this point. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to go ahead and ask those, type them in the chat. Hello, Catherine. And Jay Evans, hi, nice to meet you. Do you have any questions or anything you're curious about where 
you know, me personally or my struggle, my experience growing up. You can type, you don't have to turn your video on if you don't want to, Catherine. Great, go ahead. Oh, I forgot to mention also that my old picture, I have hair. <laughs> I've shaved it all off now. So <laughs> I think it was a mistake to shave it off, but I've got to re-shave it now all the time, you know, keep up with it. But, but in case you're wondering about the picture versus how I look now. <laughs> sure, Virginia, I can do that. Transition to adulthood. Yeah, I can cover that. Ooh, Jay Evans. That's a good question. You said, what's the most, the single most important thing for families? as they're just getting started in this process. Hmm. That's a good question for me personally. I think that um, they got to keep their minds open. They need to be open to what's the best method of communication for that child, whether it's speech, whether it's sign, um, but it's important to have communication access, language access. So Catherine, you said most of the clients you work with have what you call partial hearing loss and use hearing aids. And can you help the moms too? Absolutely. Yes, I can help the moms. Anyone. I can help anyone. Any people who have uh, some kind of hearing loss, uh, no matter what the level is, I can help them. Because personally, I use a hearing aid. So I'm familiar with that. I know how it is to use that. And I know some things connected with your experience. Yes, Jay Evans, yeah, you said that um, I've also noticed that some families are confused um, with an audiogram. They're not sure what it is they're looking at, what kind of information is provided there. And you're right about that. Audiograms can be overwhelming for some folks. Luckily, that's why here at Beginning South Carolina, we have a lot of knowledge about that. And we'll be happy to sit down with families and explain to them in depth what it is they're looking at on that audiogram so that they can understand um, better what it is that they're seeing on that audiogram. I think I missed one, let me look. Virginia, yes. Any more questions? Oh, something I thought of. I have a, another thing that I typically toss out there for your information. Sometimes mothers come to me and say that my son has a cochlear implant and he wants to play football. And I say, oh, I'm like, that's kind of dangerous. Or the mom feels it's dangerous. And I usually say, well, it's really important to talk to your audiologist about that. 
the people who know about the technology. But in my experience, Gallaudet University uh, and high school football, I've seen uh, many students who have implants and they play football. It's obviously important to be aware of that if they take a hit on the side there. There is some risk, of course, but. There's just lots of things that we can talk about and help you with. So uh, another example, I volunteered as a firefighter. And I really did go into fires and I really did uh, search for people who might be trapped. And it was not easy. It was definitely not easy. And the firemen in the area were all nervous to work with me and I understood that. So I had to kind of prove myself. I had to make sure I had a lot of training and practice and we developed different ways of communicating. For example, when I would go into a fire where all the smoke is and everything I could possibly, if I could see someone, then that was fine. But if it was a situation where the smoke was really thick and we could not even see each other, I thought, how can I communicate with others? I can't wave at them, I can't yell. At so we developed different touches. For example, if when I was in the, the place and there was a fireman behind me, he would pat me kind of two times, meaning stop. And I would, I would know to stop. If he kind of pushed on my back, on my butt, he just kind of pushed on me, it meant, okay, go ahead forward. So we had different ways of communicating um, when we couldn't see each other. So that was kind of cool. You're right, Virginia, yes. So how I learned to drive. Oh, okay, that's easy. Um, I have to think back, hold on a minute. <laughs> in high school, we had a class, driver's ed, you know, in high school. And there was an interpreter there. And I would watch the interpreter and learn the vocabulary and the different things about driving. Uh, and then when I had my hearing aid on, I could hear, I could hear pretty well with my hearing aid. So when it was actual time to practice driving with the instructor, I didn't have an interpreter with me. I would just drive and I could hear what he was saying about where to go and what to do. And I noticed he used his hand more to kind of say, go over here or stop or whatever, just, just different gestures. So I would say that I learned in the typical way. Um, but I have seen with some deaf students they want to know if the interpreter was with you and where they sat and how that worked and all that. There's a whole bunch of different ways you can manage that. Some instructors will have, sit in the back with the interpreter sitting in the front. I thought that was an interesting way of doing it. And then some interpreters sit in the back and they sign uh, in the rear view mirror, which is kind of dangerous because I'm having to look up there. <laughs> so really, um, it just really depends on what communication style or gestures you can work out with your um, instructor, where he says, go ahead, slow down, stop, whatever, and you can just pick up on those gestures. But that's a normal way to learn to drive, and many deaf people all over the world drive, so. Matt, this is Jocelyn. What, what would you say, my daughter is in middle school and we're having some transitions with new teachers and learning about her FM system and she's having to, some of that um, little apprehensiveness of using the FM because new kids, but like you said, the teacher turns around and she doesn't hear it. What's something parents can say that can help their child better advocate for themselves and understand that you know, you're in the classroom, you know what you need, just that speaking up and, and what she should do to say, I need access to this, I need help with this, to just give them that confidence. Hmm. Yeah, that's, mm. 
it's important to have that confidence. Yeah. I, mean, I know when I look back and when I had the FM system there, it was like, I always felt a little bit like, uh, I was thought of as low functioning maybe because I had that, you're not normal, something like that. There was a lot of angst related to that. And then later, and I look back on that, well, that shouldn't have been that way, but that was what it was. So my recommendation maybe is, maybe I would say first to ask, what do you want? Ask her, what does she want? What is it that you want? And maybe she's more willing to talk to you than she would be to the school. And so that would be fine, get her to talk to you. Do you want me to go with you? Or do you, and then you talk to the teacher while I'm there, but I can sit with you as kind of your support, be your ally. Um, that might be something she's willing to do is have you there so that she can explain to the teachers what it is that she needs. Or, and then ask her, would you prefer to do it yourself? And if they say she wants to do it herself, but she's nervous, and she, just reassure her teachers are there to help you. Don't try to read the mind. That's a struggle. And the teachers can't read your mind, so speak up. I was a teacher myself as well, so I know it's important to sometimes try to look at the kids and see who's struggling, maybe not. But, and sometimes when you say to the kid, are you okay? And they're like, oh, I'm great, I'm fine. And you're like, oh, well, okay. And then later on, they come to you and tell you. Um, and then once they open up, then you can have that discussion and come to a decision. But that's maybe the first step. That's the first, the toughest is the first step to step, speak up for yourself. You got to have the confidence. But once you do it, it increases your confidence. And I think she'll do better as time goes on because of that. Thank you. These were some great questions from everyone. Please go ahead and put them in the chat or um, you can open up the video. But um, Matt, just me personally, I think the word that I liked um, you say in the presentation was incorporate. Um, and that's the nice thing, like I'm a parent of a deaf and hard of hearing kid and you have your personal experience as a deaf and hard of hearing individual yourself. But you, when you mentioned being at Gallaudet, you learn from other people's experiences. And that's what hands and voices tries to do with getting parents and families together so you can see others experiences and that's essentially what you do you incorporate little tidbits from something you learn here from another person so everybody on the journey really has something to offer um, as we get to know each other and just even in your story the other word I had was pivot it was so many times you pivoted with um, the school system, the end of the school of the deaf versus going to mainstream and then going back and having to relearn ASL. Um, so like you said, we're talking to parents and what's the thing they need to be, um, the main thing they should know starting out is to be open, but open all across the journey because you pivot and you incorporate and you have to start anew sometimes with things and and you just have to be flexible with it so it was just great to hear your experiences and sharing that and I bet you families just feel a sigh of relief to to see somebody who's gone through it and been successful and firefighter like you said who would have thought but our children can do anything and you just you make those tweaks to make it work but the sky is the limit for our kids. So this was just very empowering for me to hear your story and I appreciate you sharing it. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, my journey will continue. <laughs> I'll continue to learn things. Um, and the same thing is for you, different people and just yourself and then I've just been here a few months, right, in South Carolina. So I'm meeting so many different families and people. And sometimes I'll have old feelings that kind of pop up from my struggles as a child when I meet those families. 
And I know that feeling that they're having. So it's really interesting to kind of feel that again, 20 years later <laughs> from when it originally happened as an adult and a kid, different perspective. But uh, I think I'm more aware of what that feeling means now. I have a tendency to analyze my feelings and myself and what I think or wish or want or whatever would, I wish I could communicate that, you know, share that. And identity, that's another big issue, really for everyone on the planet actually, but for people like me and your kids, deaf and hard of hearing people, identity is a big thing that has to be resolved. Who am I? Who am I as a person? Am I deaf? Mm, am I hard of hearing? Mm, that's, that's a journey in itself. It's another big issue as well. Another big thing, not an issue, a thing, sorry, interpreter error. So any more questions or? Well, I'll give. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I will give a little bit of an update and allow people time to write any final comments. But um, Lisa Jolly wasn't able to be on from beginnings, but I got some updates of some upcoming events. If you all want to jot that down, but they're always on the beginnings website, but there's actually a webinar this evening with the Department of Mental Health about coping with COVID stress, and that's at 7 p.m. And then next Tuesday, something that's nice to get the teenagers engaged and as Matt is talking about, identity is so important for our teens and youth to see other students. Um, they're gonna do their first game night with bingo next Tuesday. And then November 9th, they have meet the author with the elephant in the room. So all of that stuff can be found on their website and hands and voices for South Carolina. We will actually be doing a costume mingle October 30th in Conway, South Carolina. So if you have any parents on your caseloads, if you're professionals or know anybody in the Myrtle Beach, Conway, even Florence area, because um, folks tend to travel, we'll be at Conway Park and let the kids dress up and do Halloween slum and some pumpkin stuff. And so you can find that on our website as well. And just um, oh. Oh my gosh, it sounds like so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to hop in and say that our next topic Tuesday, um, that will be November 16th. Um, we will have Karen Kreider with the Palmetto Able Savings Program, and she'll be discussing that. Awesome. Um. Wow, I wish I could just really explain all the different things, but I know you'd have to be sitting here for so many hours. So again, if you have uh, a question later on that popped up and you're wondering if you want to know something more about me with my personal experience, I am open. I'm an open book. So feel free to email me and I'll be happy to answer your questions. I can video with you, whatever uh, you prefer.